is entitled Growing Your Marriage God's Way. Growing Your Marriage God's Way. Now this, this seminar then would be for three classes of people. Three people could come to this seminar and receive benefit. The first class would be those who are happily married. Now I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but you know if, if that definition of marriage fits your marriage. Are you happily married? I'm not talking about just a business partnership here or a relationship of tolerance where you are tolerating your wife and she is tolerating you, but a really genuinely happy marriage. I didn't say a perfect marriage. I said a what? A happy marriage. So that would be the first class of people that could benefit from this seminar. You're already happily married, but you want to be more happily married. And I don't know of any marriage that cannot be improved. Can somebody say amen? amen? Even if you have an excellent marriage this morning, it can be improved. The second group of people that this seminar would be a blessing to are those who are unhappily married. Those who are going through the motions, the experience that I just described a moment ago, where your relationship is not a relationship of love and romance and intimacy and friendship and partnership. It's more a relationship of tolerance, sort of a business relationship. She tolerates you, you tolerate her, etc., etc. If you are unhappily married here today, whether you've been unhappily married for one year or 20 years, I believe that the tools you will learn today can go a long way in giving you the assistance that you will need to get started in having a happy marriage. Now, I want to go on record as letting you know I am not a marriage counselor, okay? I'm also not a mental health professional. But I also believe that what most marriages need is not professional counseling from a mental health professional. What most marriages need is a healthy dose of the Holy Spirit, a healthy dose of the leadership of the, the man in the family, and also submission and surrender to one another and to the will of God. Amen? Amen. I'm not in any way discounting the mental health profession. There are many marriages that do need professional counseling, but my experience is most marriages simply do not need that in order to get through. And even if your marriage is one of those, I think you'll receive benefit and blessing today. So the second group would be those who are unhappily married. The third group would be those who are not married. Did any single people come? I just want to see. Anybody here? Single came. Okay, good. I'm glad a few of you did. The reason that I think this is a good seminar is for a single person is that if you want to head due north, how many of your steps need to be due north? Every single step would have to be due north. So if you wanted to head, say due north, let's just say this is north, every single step needs to be due north, but if you were going to walk in a straight line, your trajectory begins, you're going to walk in a straight line, what would be the most crucial step? Your first step, that's exactly right. Because if you are off just an inch or two on the first step and your traje trajectory continues in a straight line, you will be off by a long shot as you get a mile, two, three, four down the road. And so for those of you who have chosen to attend this seminar and are single, it will be a benefit to you because when you get started in this beautiful thing called marriage, you can start on the right foot. And how many of us are there, please don't raise your hands, who only wish that we could go back and start things differently? Just recently I conducted a, a wedding, and um, I'll tell you more about that in just a little bit, but I conducted a wedding of, of a good friend of mine, two good friends of mine, and uh, after the wedding sermon, and what you'll be hearing today is, a, is an expansion of my wedding sermon. After the wedding sermon, two ladies approached me, el older ladies, not elderly ladies, but they were older, maybe in their late 50s. They approached me, and both of them, tears streaming down their eyes, they were sisters and the aunts of the young lady that I had just married. And she said, if I would have known, if I would have known those five things that you went over today in that wedding sermon, which we're going to talk about this morning, she said, that may have saved my marriage. Beloved, the reality is, is that we need to start on the right foot and continue on the right foot. Can you say amen? amen. And I believe, beloved, you might be 20 years into a bad marriage. I believe there's hope for you. And the two things I want to give you today are hope and tools. Hope and what, everyone? Tools. It's not going to just be a rah-rah party. I'm not going to say, you can do it, get in there, you can be a good husband. No, 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 no. If it's just inspiration, you could find yourself back in the very same circumstances. What I want to try and do is give you five very easily remembered tools that I use personally in my own marriage that have helped tremendously. And as I said there in the introduction, I want you to know, and I make no bones about this, I make no apologies about this, this is not boastful,
But I can tell you in the, in the presence of God and in the presence of my wife, who no doubt will see this presentation one day, that I have an excellent marriage of eight years that gets better every single year. And I can tell you, as God is my honest witness, I am more in love with my wife, I am more attracted to my wife, and I enjoy my wife more now than I did when I married her nearly eight years ago. Can you say amen? amen? Beloved, you can have that experience. Maybe you're already having that experience. I don't want to assume that you're not. I hate it when I read one of those marriage books that talks to me as though my marriage is a bad one. Have you ever had that experience? I don't want to have that experience. I don't want you to feel like I'm talking down to you. No way. It's altogether possible that you have a better marriage uh, than I have, that you have an excellent marriage. That is altogether possible and you're attending because you want to have tools to have an even better marriage. Uh, so don't, don't, don't think that you're being talked down to. Not at all. What I want to give you is hope. What, everyone? Hope. hope because marriage is for life. Amen. We're going to talk about that. It's for life. So if you're locked into this thing, and you are locked into it, beloved, when you take those solemn vows before God, you are locked into it. But if it's a happy marriage, it's a great thing to be locked into. Amen? Amen. So we're going to talk about two things. Hope and how to have tools, actual tools that will assist you. Now, before we get into that, that's just sort of a broad overview. I'm going to have prayer, and then we're just going to dive right in. And I think you're going to be very blessed by this morning's seminar. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, this morning we come to you as men. Father, we want to confess before you that we have failed you. We make no bones about that, no rationalizations. We have failed you as fathers, as husbands, as Christians. Father, we want to begin by asking for forgiveness. And we believe that what you said in 1 John 1, 9 still holds true, that if we confess and forsake our sins, you will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Father, we also need strength. Give us strength to not continue making the same mistakes that we may have in the past. And Father, particularly as relates to us as men and to our marriages or our future marriages, Father, we need tools, we need hope, we need confidence. Father, we want to grow our marriage God's way. If marriage is a picture, a microcosm of God's relationship to the church, then surely, Father, this should be the very epicenter of love in our lives and in this world. And yet, sadly, Father, many of our marriages are just relationships of tolerance, of putting up with one another, not happy, not intimate, not romantic, and certainly not joyous. Father, I want to pray for that person who came this morning whose marriage is literally falling apart and is a shackle around his ankle. Father, give him hope today. Give him tools today. And Father, for the glory of your name and for the good of his salvation and his wife's salvation, rescue all of these poor marriages from despair and from the hands of the enemy. And Father, for those of us who have good marriages, teach us how to make our marriages better. Help us, O oh God in heaven, as we spend some time studying your word this morning and going over practical tips. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Let all the saints of the living God say, Amen. Amen. All right, our seminar is divided into two parts. The first thing we're going to do is talk about the main difference between men and women. Okay, that's the first thing we're going to do. There is a cardinal difference between men and women. Now, there are many differences, and I'm aware of that. There are significant differences in the way that men conduct themselves, the way that women conduct themselves, but I believe there is one major difference that undergirds the difference between a man and the difference between a woman. That's how we're going to begin. That will be our theological setup. It will also be observational and instructional. Then we're, we're going to move in the second part. We're going to look at five very practical principles. How many principles, beloved? Five practical principles. They all start with the letter C, the five C's of a successful marriage that you can incorporate just tonight. When you return tonight from the Michigan, Michigan Men of Faith Conference, you can start to put these tools to work in your marriage tonight, and I believe you will see immediate positive results from these five tools. So the first part that we're going to discuss is the major difference, the broad umbrella difference under which all under other differences fall. That's number one, and number two, we'll look at those five practical points. 
Let's begin by going to the book of Genesis. That's probably the very best place for us to start. Genesis chapter 2. Now men, is it safe for me to say in your hearing that men and with women are very different? Are you comfortable with that, yes or no? Amen. Yeah, the reason that we're different is that God made us that way. I want to underscore that. God has constituted men and women differently. Have you ever had a conversation with your wife or perhaps with your sister or even your mother or your fiancé? Thank you, Lord Jesus. For those of you watching on 3ABN, our in-house sound just turned on, for which we are thankful. Have you ever been having a conversation, perhaps with your wife or another woman, and you are not getting anywhere? Have you had one of those situations and you're thinking to yourself, am I if you're bilingual, you're thinking, am I speaking English or Spanish? I, I, I can't understand a word this woman is saying and all of her logic to me sounds like totally gobbledygook. And she's thinking the very same thing about you. You might say things like this. You're crazy. That doesn't make any sense. What you're saying is nonsensical. And she's thinking the very same things about you. It's like you're speaking two different languages trying to carry on a rational conversation. She's speaking in Swahili. You're speaking in Greek. And you're just like two ships passing in the night. Men and women are different. They think differently, they speak differently, they live differently, and I believe there's a very good cardinal reason for that. A biblical reason built into the very fabric of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Something built into the fabric of masculinity and femininity that makes us essentially different. Why are we talking about this? Because men, just understanding what this difference is will radically transform the way you approach your marriage. And I mean that. Just knowing this difference. Let's look at it. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. What is that difference? I don't want to oversimplify things. I don't want to overgeneralize things. But I believe that the majority of the differences that separate the female gender from the male gender boil down to this, this cardinal point. Genesis chapter 2, what verse are we in, everyone? Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to what, everyone? To tend it. In another version of the Bible that I like to read from, uh, the ESV, it says that God put him in the garden to work. Why did He put him in the garden, everyone? To work. When God put Adam into the Garden of Eden, Eve is not yet created at this point yet, he puts him there and he says, your job is to work. That's why he was there, as the, as the King, New King James says it, to tend it and to keep it. That was Adam's purpose. That was his what, everyone? Purpose. purpose. Look at verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a what? Helper, Helper or in the Old King James, a helpmeet. I will make him a helper. Now, look at verse 20 of the same chapter. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. For Adam there was not found a what? A helper or a helpmeet comparable to him. Why did God put Adam in the garden? Remind me. Why was it that He put Adam in there? To work. Why was Eve created according to what we've read? To help him. Eve was created to help Adam. What was Adam's job? To tend and to keep the garden, to work. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And God said, See, I have given you every herb, or verse 28, that's 29, and God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and what? Multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God here defines the roles of Adam and Eve before sin. Before what, everyone? Sin. And if we wanted to boil it down, it's really quite simple. Adam's job was to work and to tend the garden, and Eve's job was to help him to do that and to bear children. Are we all on the same page, yes or no? That's Genesis 1 and 2. That is before the entrance of sin. So if we wanted to distill this down, Adam's job is to work. Eve's job is to be an assistant or a helper to Adam and also to bear children. 
Okay, so far so good. Are we all on the same page, yes or no? Now look at what happens after sin. Many people don't understand this, but look at what happens in Genesis chapter 3. After sin, when the so-called curses are pronounced, they were actually blessings more than curses. In Genesis chapter 3, pick it up in verse 17. Then to Adam he said, God speaking to Adam, the fall has transpired, we know the story. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. That's why it was a blessing, for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of you you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now, look at verse 14 of the same chapter, verse 16 of the same chapter. To the woman, he said, God speaking to Eve, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your what? conception or your childbearing. Second part of the verse, in pain you shall bring forth children, your desire shall be for your what? Your husband and he shall rule over you. Now this is fascinating. This, this is God articulating the roles post-sin, right? What were the roles pre-sin? Adam's job was what? Primarily everyone? to work, and Eve's job was to help and to bear children. That's pre-sin. Now post-sin, God re-articulates the roles, and what does he say Adam's role is post-sin? To work. It's the very same thing, isn't it? Except there is an element of pain and bitterness attached to it. Do you see that, yes or no? The roles didn't change. All that changed was that now when Adam went out to work the fields, instead of a sinless earth easily, bountifully putting forward the things that Adam and Eve were to eat, now he would have to toil for it by the sweat of his brow. His job description didn't change. He was still a worker. What about Eve's job description? Does it change? It does not change, beloved. Look at it. Is she still to bring forth children, yes or no? Was that part of her pre-sin job description? Yes. Except there's an element in the post-sin job description. What is it? Pain. There's pain associated with it. And then he says, your desire will be for your husband and he shall rule over you. <laughs> now, in this politically correct society, society in which we live today, these are not popular verses. But let's just unpack what's being articulated here. What God is saying is that Eve will derive her purpose, listen carefully to these words, Eve will derive her purpose and her meaning and her reason for existence from what Adam does. That's what it means. His de your desire will be for your husband. That's very much the same way it was pre-sin, except now the element of rulership is introduced, which we're not going to unpack this morning. Now you say, what, what is the big difference here? Please listen. Understanding this one central difference will assist us enormously in making our marriage a happy, healthy, and holy one. And here it is. Men, now this is not a hard and fast rule. It's not like one plus one is two. But this is a broad biblical principle. It's a what did I say, everyone? A broad biblical principle. Because invariably when you start talking about rules, somebody's going to say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Sure, there are exceptions to the rule, but broadly speaking, we can learn a very important truth here, a very important truth in Genesis 1 and 2, and that is this. Man derives, as a general rule, I'm talking about man right here, masculinity, derives his meaning, his reason for existence, and his fulfillment and satisfaction in life from what he does with his hands. Are you with me? He's a worker. That's what he was in Eden. That's what he is today. For a man to be a failure, he would have to be thinking thoughts like this, I haven't accomplished anything. Right? Does that make sense? If you felt like, well, I've, I've, not got, I've not accomplished anything. Here I am, 40 years old, I've not accomplished anything. I'm a failure. That's the way men think. 
We derive a significant part of our self-worth, our value, our meaning in life based on what we have accomplished and what we have done. We like to build the doghouse, step back and say, that's a mighty fine doghouse. Look, look at the quality, look at the architecture of this doghouse. We put new cabinets in the kitchen. We didn't hire somebody from Home Depot to come do it. We saved ourselves $1,200. Sure, the cabinets don't look quite like they could have, but, but look at those cabinets, fine pieces of architectural beauty. Aren't they, sweetie? Sweetie? Hmm. More often than not, men become workaholics more than women. It's not that a woman can't become a workaholic. In fact, in the society in which we live today, it is increasingly true that women are being pushed, pushed, pushed into the career mold, the career mentality. But as a general rule, it's the man that spends too much time at work. Are you hearing me? Now, you're going to say, well, that's because my boss is driving me. That's because we have this project to get done. That's because da 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 No, 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 no. The reason is, whether you would admit it or not, to some greater or lesser degree, we are driven by what we're doing. If we've done a good job, then we have succeeded as a man. Are you with me, yes or no? God has built that into the fabric of your being. You'd better come to grips with it. Now, there is the man that is the exception. Sure, you might be that exception. I doubt it. Most men derive at least some part of their self-worth, their reason for existence from what they have accomplished, what they have done. It doesn't always have to be work-related either. I just went on a fishing trip this last week, two-day fishing trip. And uh, we drove, can't believe I'm telling you this publicly, we drove from Troy all the way to Sault Ste. Marie, right? And we, we left at 9 o'clock at night. After church board meeting, we drove due north. Well, that's about six hours from where I live. We drove through the night, and we got across the border there into Canada. We fished on the Canadian side, and uh, it was 2.30 in the morning. We didn't have a place to sleep. And so we went and slept in a city park. No, no joke. Nathan and I, we just pulled out our sleeping bags and went and found a dark place behind a city park bench, and we just went to sleep in the city park. We hope no policemen showed up, right? Can you imagine saying, no, we're pastors, really. We are pastors <laughs> sleeping in this park. This was three days ago. Now, the reason we did that is we didn't want to get a hotel because we needed to be up at the first, you know, little hint of dawn. And so three hours later, you know, we could just start to see the hint of dawn. So we woke up. We're getting all our fishing gear ready. We were going to go fishing in the St. Mary's. Okay, we're fly fishing in the St. Mary's. Anybody ever been fishing in the St. Mary's River? Terrifying. Okay, absolutely terrifying. The water is just, you know, just pouring through there. We're in our waders, and you start to wade across. And uh, the long and the short of it is, if water starts to get in your waders, it's a very bad situation. Okay, especially in torrential rapids. And uh, every one of us, Scott, myself, and Nathan, were calling on the name of the Lord Jesus that we didn't die in these rapids trying to catch a silly fish. <laughs> well, here's the point. We're there for, for six hours, fishing, 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 and uh, guess how many fish we caught? <laughs> Zero, not one fish, not one bite, nothing. All of that for nothing. So I got to call my wife on the way home that night, right? I'm like, hey, sweetie, how are you doing? You know, I've not slept very much, and, and uh, I'm on my way back home. And, oh, she says, how was the fishing trip? <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> right? What she's asking is, what? Did you catch any fish? To which I respond, well, nobody was catching any fish. <laughs> That trip was a failure, right? It was fun. It was a good time to go sleep in the park. That was fun. But the trip was a failure. We didn't accomplish anything. It felt like it was a waste of time and energy. Whether it's recreation or work or, or any such thing, men tend to derive their meaning, their significance, and part of their self-worth from what they have accomplished. If a man, if you find a man who says, I'm a failure, usually that will have something to do with the fact that he doesn't feel like he's accomplished what he could have accomplished at that point in his life. I failed. Or if a man has succeeded, oh, that man, he's, he's got his own business. Oh, he has his own business with 300 employees. They do, you know, $2.4 million in business a year. Oh, he's a success. Now, what about Eve? Based on both the pre- and post-sin descriptions of Eve's roles, and don't miss this, men, this is critical. 
Just as a man derives a significant part of his existence and his self-worth from what he accomplishes with his hands, a woman's self-worth, existence, and meaning in life is tied not to what she does, but to her husband. Do you see that? Yes or no? Pre-sin, what was her job description pre-sin? She's a helper. What, what did God say about her role post-sin? Your desire will be for your what? Husband. Now, beloved, don't miss that. If a woman derives her, a, a, a woman, in, in this case your wife, if she's deriving a significant part of her worth, her self-worth, her value, and the reason for existence from you, and that is not going well, or you're working too much, or you're an absentee husband and an absentee father, if her meaning for life and existence for life and reason for existence is tied up with you, this is going to be very determinative for how your relationship will work itself out on a day-to-day -day basis. Because here's the thing, friends. I'm not going to like this very much. I'm going to say it anyway. If a marriage is falling apart, I get myself into trouble when I tell this, tell this to men, but I'm going to say it anyway. If a marriage is falling apart, it is always at least 60% the man's fault. Now, I'll put an asterisk there and say, in the rare occasion, such is not the case. The rare occasion, less than one in a thousand. I want to repeat it. If a marriage is falling apart, it is at least 60% the man's fault. Usually more. Now you're sitting there thinking, perhaps this preacher is crazy. He doesn't know my wife. Right? If he knew my wife, he would change that silly theory of his in two seconds flat. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. Your wife is taking cues from you. You hear me? If a marriage has fallen apart, it is largely because a man has not created the spiritual familial environment in which a woman can feel safe and secure in that marriage. Amen. Amen. Now that stings a little bit. I'm not here to discourage you. Why is that? Why is it the case that it is primarily the man's fault whenever a marriage falls apart? It's because the woman's self-worth, not entirely, but largely is tied up with you, with who you are. If you create a good environment, you'll have a good marriage. Period. Are there exceptions to that? Sure. Sure, there are always exceptions. But on the whole, you create a spiritual, healthy, wholesome, romantic environment in your home, you proactively do that, your wife will respond to that. She will take her cues on how she responds to you from the way you conduct yourself. You're the leader. She derives much of who she is from you, not from what she does. That's not the way a woman's mind thinks. It's not that she goes and does things and therefore she's a success. She's taking her cues from you. If you set the tone, she will follow. You set a negative tone, she will follow, and then you have problems. Are you hearing me, yes or no? Now, beloved, just understanding that one difference. You can literally remove a woman's reason for existence. You can shatter her entire world by being a workaholic. Right? You can shatter your wife's entire world by spending more time with your friends than with her. Right? There's not a man on the planet, probably, that doesn't have that wrestling tension sometimes with his wife about time with the guys or, or time with you. Time with the guys or time with you. And that's always hard for us to understand. But friends, it's, it's not hard to understand if we can begin to remember that you are the whole reason, the whole... Uh, I don't, I don't want to speak here in overgeneralizations, but I'm going to speak that way just so we can get the point into our minds. You are a significant part of the reason that your wife exists. She's taking her cues from you, and if she feels like she is just the caboose in your marriage, if she is just a part of your life, and you are the whole reason for hers, this will crush her out. Are we on the same page, yes or no? 
You are the engine that drives her life, her reason for existence. She is taking her cues from you, and if your wife feels like she is only one part of your life, one helping among the salad bar, then she'll feel crushed out and you will have an unhappy marriage. Friends, if you have an unhappy wife, you'll have an unhappy marriage. You might be thinking to yourself, man, he, this guy doesn't know my wife. He just doesn't know my wife. I'm going to say it publicly and you're not going to like it. If your marriage is a wreck, I believe in the sight of God. Could the, could the holy scales that show who's at fault and who isn't at fault, could those holy scales be removed? Could the veil be torn back? I think you would discover that in God's sight, the vast majority of the responsibility for your marriage falling apart rests on your shoulders, even if you don't like to hear it. It's true. Does that, mean that there are, does that mean that there are not errant women that go off and do things and a godly man like, like Hosea of old who's trying? Sure, that happens. But on the whole, the fault rests with men. It does. Think about it this way. If a church goes into apostasy, say your church, and your church goes into apostasy because your unfaithful pastor is preaching apostasy, will God hold the church responsible, yes or no? Will God hold the church responsible if the church falls away, yes or no? Now think about, let's think that through. Let's say you have a church of a hundred people and you have a pastor that stands up and preaches some craziness, right? And let's say that 70 members in that church fall away and go after the pastor's nonsense. Will God hold those 70 members accountable for going after the pastor's nonsense? Yes or no? Yes. Come on, beloved, of course. Why? Because every one, of those has a, every one of those 70 has a brain and a Bible they can think for themselves. They don't have to go along with what some charismatic leader says. Does God hold them responsible? Yes. But who does he hold more responsible? The leader. Now, if we as men can say with almost unanimity here, with, with what would no doubt be unanimity, if we can say here that in that circumstance, the pastor is more accountable than the parishioners. Are the parishioners accountable? We all say what? Yes, but who's more accountable? The pastor. And we say, well, why? That's not fair. How come the pastor's more accountable? Because he's the leader. Now, if we can say with, with objectivity that that is true in a church situation, then we need to say with equal objectivity that it is true in a marriage situation. If God has called you to be the leader and the whole thing has gone to hell in a handbasket, do all the other members of that family have responsibility and a burden to bear? Is there culpability there? Sure there is, but where does most of the culpability lie? With you. Amen. Amen. Now, let's move from that difference. I'm going to continue to unpack that difference, but men, that alone I tell you. Just understanding that your wife even if you're a bad husband, that's the amazing thing about women. Even if you have been a pathetic husband, like a bad one, if you will turn around, your wife will love you just as if you had been a great husband all those years. God has put into the heart a willingness to forgive in the heart of a woman if and when the man can step up to the plate and be what God has called him to be. Just knowing that one central difference alone, that that, that your wife is going to take her cues from you as to how she conducts herself in a marriage, that alone can help you tremendously. Now, I have married people, I think, 10 times since I've been a pastor, 10 or 11 wedding ceremonies. And every time I do a wedding ceremony, I preach the same sermon. I don't know why they keep asking me to marry them. I always preach the same sermon every time. They know what they're going to get. I tell them, I'll preach the same sermon that you heard today. Oh, that's the one I want. <laughs> okay? So here's my wedding sermon. I'm going to give it to you. What I do is I stand up front and I say, listen, your carnal nature, Satan, 
and this society are all warring against you having a successful marriage. But I can guarantee you here today that if you will follow these five simple principles, you will have a successful marriage. That's what I say to the newlyweds. Okay? And I'm going to make it very easy on you newlyweds because it's going to be hard for you to remember anything I say because all you can think about right now is looking longly, longingly into your spouse's, future spouse's eyes. So I'm going to make it very simple for you to remember. Five C's. Beloved, I'm going to go so far as to say that if you practice these five C's, it is impossible for you to have a bad marriage. Seriously. If you practice these five C's, you cannot have a bad marriage. And I'll go even further than that. If you presently have a bad marriage and you earnestly and sincerely and meaningfully put these five C's into practice, your bad marriage will become a good marriage. Okay? You want to know what the five C's are? Yes or no? First one. Conversion. Men, listen to me. 99% of any marriages, marriage's success is the conversion of the participants in that marriage. You hear me clucking? Yes or no? You cannot take two converted people. What kind of people did I say? You cannot take two converted people who have totally, completely dedicated and surrendered their lives to the Lord Jesus and put them into a marriage and have them get divorced. That can't happen. That is impossible. Because a totally converted person is totally surrendered to the will of God and the Bible says God hates divorce. The most important factor in your marriage is your daily conversion, your surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. That includes praying in your closet by yourself. That includes studying the Bible for yourself. That includes praying with your wife. That includes being involved actively in witnessing and reaching out to people in your community. Amen. If you are converted and your wife is converted, you can't get a divorce. Now, some people aren't going to like that. Because they're going to say, Oh, preacher, I was converted and I got a divorce. Really? If you weren't divorced on biblical grounds and it wasn't entirely your wife that was pushing it, then I would strongly question your conversion. I believe because the Bible solemnly declares... If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If you take two genuinely converted, what did I say? Genuinely converted Christians, biblically informed Christians, and you put them in a marriage together, they cannot get divorced as long as they stay converted. If you're having problems in your marriage, you come to me for marriage counseling, the very first question I will ask you is, are you converted? And if you say to me, yes, I'm going to say, how much time did you spend in Bible study this morning? If you say, well, I was a little busy this morning, I'll say, okay. How much time did you spend yesterday morning? Ten minutes. All right. How about the morning before? I was busy that morning too. How much time did you spend in prayer? I'll ask you the tough questions. You can tell me with your mouth you're converted, but beloved, if we're not doing the things that converted people do, we're only making the profession of conversion. Can you say amen? amen? You come to me for marriage counseling? Sure, I'll give you marriage counseling. And the very first question I will ask in that session, I will look to the man and I will say, are you converted? And if you say no, I'll say your marriage doesn't have a hope anyway. Second question, I turn to the woman and I say, are you converted? If I get a yes from the man and a yes from the woman, then you know what I do? I turn to the woman and I say, is he converted? <laughs> you hearing me? Don't worry, the woman gets her just dues as well. I turn to him and I say, is she converted? Beloved, would you agree with me that the hardest place to be a Christian is in your home? Let me tell you, you want to know where the easiest place to be a Christian is? In church. Oh, man, it's so easy to be a Christian in church. You just wear the right clothes and don't speak up. <laughs> Amen? But I tell you, you get into your home, and that's where it's tough to be a Christian. But, beloved, if you can be a Christian in your home, you can be a Christian anywhere. If you can be a Christian in your home, you can be a Christian in the torture chamber. 
You can be a Christian in your home. You can be a Christian when you are standing before a military tribunal at the end of time. If you can be a Christian in your home, you can be a Christian anywhere, even in solitary confinement. There is no place where it is harder to be a Christian than when you have exposed yourself in total vulnerability to another person who gets to see what your best and your worst. Now, I can say to the glory of God in heaven, if you put my wife on a letter this morning right here on the stage, and you said to him, okay, here we go. Here it is, the $64,000 question. Is he converted? She would say, yes, he's converted. Now, if you said, is he a perfect husband? She'd say, no, but he's a Christian. You don't have to be a perfect husband in order for your wife to see that you are making strides toward the kingdom of God. Amen. Conversion. That's the first C. If you're not converted and your wife is not converted, then you barely have a chance at all to preserve your marriage. However, if you can get converted or stay converted and your wife, and you say, well, what about my wife? I'm converted and my wife isn't. Okay, that's a, legitimate, that's a legitimate objection. If you're totally converted and your wife isn't, then your job as a man is to create an environment in which she wants to be converted. That's what God was trying to teach Hosea about his people. He said, hey, Hosea, I got this nice lady I want you to marry. Oh, yeah, really? She's a whore. She's a prostitute. You're going to love it. What? Now you will know how I feel about my people. Friends, I believe that if the man is totally converted, even if the woman is out to lunch, that marriage has a good chance of survival. Because a woman, remember, takes her cues from who? From the man. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 when he says, if you have an unbelieving wife, stick it out, men, because the unbelieving wife will be sanctified by the godly deportment of the husband. Conversion. If your marriage is falling apart, you have to ask yourself the hard questions. Are you really converted? If you're not willing to ask yourself the hard questions, let me ask them. How much time do you spend in Bible study? A day. How much time do you spend reading the Bible? A day. How much time do you spend watching television? A day. How much time do you spend in prayer? A day. When was the last time you won somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ? I'll ask you the hard questions. I continue to believe that we should make membership in the Seventh-day Adventist Church contingent upon everybody winning at least one soul per year. I believe that should be a membership requirement in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. If we say you have to abstain from pork, and is that important, yes or no? Is that part and parcel of being a Christian, yes or no? Listen, if somebody steps on the, steps on the, the, the platform there at my church and says, I want to be a Seventh-day Adventist, and I say, will you abstain from eating unclean meats? And they say, no, I'll say, you can keep coming to church, but you can't join my church. What is a more important part of being a Christian? Abstaining from bacon or sharing the good news of the gospel with those around you? Yeah, you know what it is. So if we're going to make abstinence from pork a contingency for participation in this church, then why not soul winning as an actual requirement for being a member in the remnant church of God? Amen. Amen. You say, that sounds radical. It's totally radical, and it's totally biblical. If you're not winning souls, you're not a Christian. You don't like that? I'm sorry. Desire of ages, every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God, a missionary. Amen. If you're not a missionary, you're not a true disciple, right? David Ashray didn't say it. The Red Book said it. Number one, conversion. Ask yourself the hard questions. Number two, commitment. I was recently counseling with a pastor and his wife. They were talking about getting divorced. He had his bags packed. He was on the way out the door. A pastor had his bags packed, ready to leave his wife. On biblical grounds, no, 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 no. They couldn't get along. Said, hey, we're in a dire situation. You need to come over. We need help. So we, my wife and I, we went over there. We sat right on the couch, and, and sure enough, bags were packed, waiting at the door. And this thing is over. Married more than 10 years. Game over. I'm out of here. Sick and tired of putting up with this crazy woman. I'm sick and tired of putting up with this crazy man. Done. It's all right. I looked that man in the eye and I said to him, is divorce an option? Well, you know, I said, listen, don't talk that way. I just want a yes or no answer. Is divorce an option? A 
Remember, they didn't have biblical grounds. He didn't want to answer. All right, I'll ask you. Turn to the woman. Is divorce an option? No, that's not. You don't have to tell me the whole. I don't want to hear the story. I want to know if divorce is an option. They didn't want to answer. Beloved, listen to me. If divorce is an option, you'll get a divorce. Do you hear what I said? If divorce is an option, and I'm talking about on non biblical grounds, if you get to the place where you just can't tolerate that crazy woman anymore, if divorce is an option, you'll get a divorce. If divorce is not an option, then guess what? You won't get a divorce. You have to settle that in your mind right now. Is divorce an option? Commitment, number two, commitment. Listen, I was going to run a marathon. Anyone here ever ran a marathon before? Okay, I gave up before I even started. God bless you guys. <laughs> I bought the book. I bought the book, How to Run Your First Marathon. And uh, whoo, I started uh, thumbing through that thing, and I thought, Lord have mercy, training schedule, training regimen. You know, I think I'll run a 5K. <laughs> you know what, though? You know what the book said? Actually, I, got, I b had that book and another one, and both books said the same thing in the introduction. They said a marathon is run between the ears. You know where a marathon is run? It's not run here. <laughs> marathon is run between the ears. You have to decide. When you take the first step, If not finishing the race is an option, you're not going to finish the race. If you take the first step and you're thinking to yourself, you know, I'm going to see how it goes. You know, if I'm feeling good at, at 12 mile, I'm going to keep it up. If I'm feeling good at mile 22, I'm going to keep it up. If you're thinking, I'll see how things go, and as long as things go well, I'll stay with it, you're not going to finish the race. Both books said, in order to, to run a marathon for your first time, especially if you're a little older, you have to say with the first step, I will finish this race. Walking out of this race prematurely is not an what? It's not an option. Number two, commitment. Are you committed to your wife for life? Listen, if the answer to that is no, then you'll get a divorce. Because it will just take circumstances that are just dire enough, bad enough, and austere enough to get you out of there. Number two, commitment. Are you committed to that woman for life? Did you mean it when you swore before God that you would stick it out with her? Now, even on biblical grounds, and I've got to throw this in very quickly. I've got to be so careful how I tell this story. A man that I know, a pastor, I'm going to tell it to you quick, comes home, honey, I'm home. She was home too with the elder in bed, okay? What does he do? Goes into the bedroom, says, sweetie, get your clothes on. Please, sir, get your clothes on, and I want to meet you in the living room. They get their clothes on, comes into the living room. This is a true story. Sits down in the living room, gives them a Bible study on the grace and forgiveness of God, sends the man home. <laughs> Three years later, honey, I'm home. She was home too, with the elder, same guy. Get your clothes on, sweetie, get your clothes on, please. I'd like to see you in the living room. They meet in the living room, sits down, gives them a Bible study on the love, grace, and forgiveness of God. See ya. Still married. Five years later, so eight years from the first time this happened, and this is just when she was caught. Different church, different district. Honey, I'm home same man, hundreds of miles away. So you get your clothes on. Can you get your clothes on? I'd like to see you in the living room. Living room, Bible study on the love and forgiveness of God. Have a good night. She divorced him. She couldn't take it. Is divorce an option? Listen. Even when you have biblical grounds, Jesus didn't say you had to get divorced. Amen? Now, friends, let me tell you, that's a true story. I know the man that did that. And let me tell you, you think that would take some guts, yes or no? Yes. Come on, man. I tell you, my respect for that man it rivals the respect that I have for any man on this planet. Today, he's happily married to another woman. She left him. Biblical, great husband. Number two. What's number two, everyone? 
commitment. Is divorce an option? If divorce is not an option, then guess what you won't do? You won't get divorced. Number three, compassion. Whew, there is so much that could be said here. Men, you've got to be sweeter. How many men here like having sex? Did the pastor just say that on 3ABN? <laughs> I didn't see the hands there. You were too timid. <laughs> Listen, men, God invented sex, amen? amen? He invented it. He made it pleasurable. It's better than a handshake, and he made it that way. There's no shame in it. <laughs> amen? There is no shame in it. Amen. Right? I refuse to let this society get the victory over something that God has created to be enjoyed within the confines of a marriage relationship. Amen. There's no shame in this. Listen, beloved. You want a good sex life with your wife? It's possible. And here's what I tell young couples, and here's what I'm telling you. If you concentrate on the compassion, the passion will take care of itself. I want to say that again. You concentrate on the compassion, and the passion will take care of itself. I don't need to tell you that sex is different for a man than it is for a woman. For a woman, it's about security. It's about relationships. It's about how the day went. It's about how the marriage is going. You worry about the compassion, the tenderness, the sweetness, the kindness. Do you hear the words I'm using, men? the romance. You worry about the compassion and the passion will take care of itself. No marriage was ever built on a good sex life. But every good marriage will eventually produce a good sexual intimate experience. Are you hearing me, yes or no? Yes. If we think that our marriage is going to be happy based on a good sexual experience. Is that part of a marriage? Yes, it is. But friends, we are putting the cart before the horse. Your job as, to man is to, as a man, your job as the man is to worry about the compassion, the tenderness, the kindness, the sweetness, the roses, the flowers, the dates. Not just what you say, but in the way you say it. Put a tenderness in your voice. Put a sweetness into your voice. There is not a day that goes by that my wife, Violetta, does not hear at least five times that she is the most beautiful woman in the world. You think she knows I, I believe that? Listen, I've sold it to her every single day since we've been married that we've been together. She hears it every day and she's going to keep hearing it. I want her to know that I am madly in love with her and absolutely, totally attracted to her. Amen? Amen. Sweet things. Compassion. I could say more there, but I'm going to stop. Number one, what was the first C? Conversion. What percentage of your marriage is that? 99%. Conversion. That's 99%. What was the second C? Commitment. Commitment. What's the third C? Compassion. Fourth C. Compromise. Oh, man, you're stubborn, aren't you? You've got to learn the art of compromise. Now, we do not compromise. By the way, if you guys are planning on coming to this seminar later, you have to go out because now you're going to think you're getting two for the price of one. These are the guys waiting in the back. <laughs> Compromise. But the, the stuff before this has been really good, hasn't it, guys? Yeah, yeah so you've got to come to it. Compromise. Beloved, never compromise in principle, but you have to learn to compromise in preference. If you want the red car and she wants the black car, you get the blue car. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Compromise is essential. You have to let go of some of your stubbornness. You have to learn that not every hill is a hill to die on. Amen? Amen? There will be things that your wife does that are going to drive you absolutely, totally insane and crazy. Let it go. Amen? Amen. There are more things in you that drive her crazy. Compromise. Learning the art of compromise. How to reach an agreeable conclusion when two parties are in conflict. And last but not least, last one, communication. E, communication. Conflict resolution skills and communication. Man, I'm going to give you a tool here. 
When your wife says something that's driving you crazy and you think to yourself, did that crazy woman just say what I think she said? <laughs> don't say anything. Don't respond and say, well, you want to take this? Say, uh, uh, uh. Don't do that. Here's what you do. Here's a tool. Here's a tool. Your wife says something crazy and you say, uh, 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 uh. Hmm. say, sweetie, What I heard you say was thus and so. Is that what you said? And nine times out of ten, she'll say, no, that's not what I said at all. What I said was thus and so. And then you'll say, well, that's just as crazy anyway, but then don't respond to that. <laughs> say, sweetie, here's what I'm hearing you say. Is that what you're saying? No, that's not what I'm saying. And you're going to learn that you are an absolutely terrible listener. <laughs> well, what are you saying? And then finally, after about four or five bouts of that, you're going to get it. And what she was actually trying to say is very different than what you originally thought she was saying. If you find yourself reacting to that first thing you were just sure she said, and man, you're going to let her have it, not physically, of course, but you're going to let her have it with the mouth, you find that you start responding not to what you think she said, but trying to discover what she's actually saying and have her give you the same courtesy. If you say something stupid, and I know you're men, so you never say anything stupid, have her say to you, now, honey, this is what I'm hearing you say. Is that what you're saying? No, that's not what I'm saying. This simple communication device. Simple what, everyone? Communication, communication device. Last one. Last one on, on communication. A good friend of mine, his parents had been married for 16 years, they were going to get divorced. They went to the marriage counselor, she said, bah, 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 gave her side, and he said, bah, 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 and gave his side, and the marriage counselor was, was just listening, and he was a very wise marriage counselor, and finally he looked up to them and he said, listen, I'm going to save you a lot of money and a lot of time. He looks to the man and says, do you want to preserve this marriage? Yes, I do. Looks to the woman and says, do you want to preserve this marriage? Yes, I do. Then he says, I'm going to save you time, I'm going to save you money, I'm going to save you energy. Take a 15-minute walk together every day and just talk. Just what? Talk. Talk. And he said, come back in three months. Three months later, happily married. To this day, happily married. Men, listen to your wives. Take time. Take what did I say? Time. time to just listen to what they're saying. Don't solve their problems. Just listen to what they're saying. So in review, what are the five C's? Very quickly. What's the first one? Conversion. The second one is? Commitment. Third one is? Compassion. Fourth one is? Compromise. Fifth one is? Communication. That, coupled with the fact that men and women are fundamentally different at the core of their being, as we discovered in Genesis 1 and 2, will enable you to grow your marriage God's way. Can you say amen? amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I pray you'll be with these men, Lord. They're good men. They want to be better men and better husbands. Father, I pray that something that was said in this session, in this seminar, would enable them to be more effective as they minister to their wives, to their families, and ultimately to themselves and their churches. Father, please bless us here at the Men of Faith Conference and give us a rich experience with you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Let all the saints say, Amen. Thank you, men.